what you're seeing in the public markets, how is it affecting what you're doing in the private markets at the moment? Yeah, I think there's a think forward, reason back element to this. Ultimately, everyone's dream is to sell the business to the public markets, to get big enough that you need that access to liquidity. But if it's not available, and if it's not available at the valuation that you hoped it was, then the work back from there is that valuations need to start coming back in the par private markets as well, in the venture side of things and in the private equity side of things. And I think we're starting to see that. You're starting to see venture fundraising struggle. You're starting to see down rounds. You're starting to see failed auction processes. You're starting to see the signs that the market pricing environment might be getting a little tighter and a, light, a little bit more rational. Okay, so the exuberance goes down a little bit as well. What does that mean for the exit strategy of early investors? Uh, do we see them taking it to other VCs, other uh, sponsors, rather than letting it go public? Yeah, I think there's one of three ways these go. Either you can find the holy grail at the end of the rainbow, and a few of them have, Uber, Lyft, and others. You can sell to a strategic, which a lot of them do. Uh, Harry's selling to Edgewell was a great example of that. Or you fail. And, and I think the market is assuming that most of the businesses will end up in buckets one and two. Mm -hmm. And I actually think think most of the businesses will end up in bucket three, mm. wow. that they really didn't build fundamentally viable economic engines. They built growth at any price. And I think what we're seeing in a lot of these difficult IPOs is the market starting to return from destruction to construction, from disruption to, to what are you going to build for me, and asking questions about fundamental economics. Do you make money? Is this a good business, not just a good growth engine? And I'm not sure that, that all of those growth engines are actually good businesses. I mean, it's interesting, even as just yesterday we were analyzing Netflix's numbers and it looks as though they're now going for profit rather than yes. growth at any cost. We've heard Masaoshi Sun saying that mm -hmm. he wants that of his portfolio companies now. Are you starting to ask of your portfolio companies? Have you always been asking of your portfolio? Yeah, we've always asked that. I think we, we believe that business truths are business truths and economics are economics and you can't make it up on volume when you don't make money on the first trade. Hmm. And so we, we try to asset select our way into fundamentally good businesses that have good core economic engines that produce uh, economic return and that reinvest in themselves sustainably. And so hopefully we're a little bit inoculated from this problem and, and you know, have picked our assets well in the face of it. What's an example of a good business in terms of business models that work right now? Yeah, look, I, Canada Goose is one we're lucky enough to partner with. Um, I partnered with Danny Reese uh, six years ago, and that is a great business. They make money on every sale. They're disciplined about pricing. They grow in a responsible way, and they try to make sure that the market demand is always in excess of the supply of their product so that they can sustain it and they can sustain the economics behind it. That, to me, is a winning growth formula. When you're losing money at the gross margin level and, yeah. and hoping that once we get to scale, it's all going to work out, I think the market has a lot of skepticism about that view today. It's true of Amazon, but it's not true of everybody. We're looking at some of your portfolio now, Tom's Virgin Voyages, Sundar. Talk to us about where the, re well, the consumer is right now and, and how you're looking internationally as well as the US, because we feel like the US consumer is unstoppable, but that's certainly not the case when you're in Europe and Asia. Yeah, I wish I were a better macroeconomist. I'd, I'd probably make more money as an investor, uh, but it certainly feels like the consumer's pretty saturated right now. They, we've gone through a wave of consumer choice where brand proliferation has happened. If you buy beauty products, as an example, you go into a Sephora, you used to have 10 products, now you have 400 to choose so from. True. <laughs> and the consumer's loaded up their pantry. They've bought 20 color palettes and 15 eyeliners. And you saw that in Ulta's results last quarter, that the consumer slowed down for them because they said, enough, I, I'm overserved at the mm -hmm. moment. And so it's great for us as consumers. We get choice, we get price, we get selection. But a little bit, the market got ahead of itself in all of that. And I think, I think you're starting to see the consumer slow down and say, okay, you know, what, where do I really want to spend my money? And what's the right place to, to invest my precious capital? Do you see any impact from the tariffs at all, especially with the December tariffs coming up? I know you're not a macroeconomist, but it yeah. must factor into how yeah, businesses sure. operate. We own retailers and we have to think about that. I, it, tariffs are a very real issue, uh, and, and particularly for retail, uh, you know, when you acquire a lot of your goods from China, you're going to feel the impact of tariffs. One of the things I've been surprised by, candidly, as I've met with a bunch of CEOs, is I, I don't think everyone is quite as ready for it as they should be. I think yeah. a lot of people had subconsciously bet that you know, it was a bluff, that Schedule 3 wouldn't happen, mm -hmm. that we would never get to the place we've gotten to and they weren't quite ready for it.